Hello everybody, my name is Marco Valgimigli. I am an interventional cardiologist working at the Bern University Hospital in Switzerland and I'm here in Paris at the Euro PCR 2019 joined by two friends and colleagues to discuss a very important topic. From one side we have Rafael Romaguera from uh, Spain, uh, Barcelona, welcome. Good morning. Andrew. And on the other side we have Dr. Rosli from Malaysia. Yeah. So let me kick off uh, by you, uh, Rafael. Uh, we are discussing actually how to handle the revascularization procedure in patients with diabetes. So let us know what is your standard approach in this patient population. Thank you, Marco. Diabetic patients are coming very often to our cath lab and usually uh, com uh, coronary anatomy are really complex. So the first thing that I see is the, the scenario. If it's a primary PCI, of course, PCI quick and fast. But otherwise, what I recommend is to stop for one minute and think what's the better strategy for, for the patient. So if coronary complexity is, not, is, not, is intermediate or low, I think that PCI uh, can be a good alternative. Of course, if we go that way, we have to use uh, what has been called the, the best-in-class strategy or state-of-the-art, which will be using functional assessment of intermediate lesions and, of course, ensure a position and expansion of the stent with intravascular uh, imaging and post dilation and use the best tool that we have, a new uh, antidiabetic uh, glucose-lowering drugs use new antiplatelet drugs and use the, the best devices that, that we may have in our lab. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Rosalie, now uh, I'm uh, looking at you and yes. you know that you have actually, by definition, a, big, a bigger experience on that topic than us, if anything because of the prevalence of diabetes in your country. Yes. So I know that in Malaysia, but I would say even generally in Asia Pacific, it's more than 50%. What is the key element to decide which revascularization strategy to go for, PCI versus cabbage here? Right. You're absolutely right, because uh, one out of two patients undergoing PCI in Malaysia, and even in the Southeast Asian region, are diabetics. So there are two main issues that we face. Number one is a patient issue, and number two is uh, the lesion of factors. We tend to see patients with uh, more uh, uncontrolled diabetes, associated with hypertension, and stage renal disease, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and pr people with uh, strokes. And a, a number of patients actually present with no symptoms to suggest infarct. They just present with uh, decrease in effort tolerance, and an ECG showed that there's infarct. So this is not an uncommon uh, phenomenon in patients who are diabetic. The second issue that we find is that uh, the lesion characteristics, they tend to be more diffuse, multi-vessel disease, multi-level, small vessels, long lesions. And this makes the treatment more difficult. But, uh, you know, in Asia, lots of people who do not want to go for surgery, uh, and even despite being counseled. So in cases like this, we want to ensure that we get as good results as we can in terms of controlling uh, the risk factors, especially getting diabetes under control and secondly, get as good results as we can. And this is where I feel that sometimes, uh, if we can, uh, besides the technical issues, if it's possible to have a, a drug looting stand, perhaps, that has got better data in uh, treating or tackling diabetic patients uh, than what we have now. The catch-up phenomenon is still there in diabetics. So this is an area which I think is very important. Thank, thank you very much, very important point. So if I can actually, in a way, rephrase what you said, you are speaking about efficacy and safety at the same time, combined in one single magic platform yes. would actually would make it happen. And so now I'm turning to you, Rafael. We have seen uh, not a lot of studies, but we have seen studies in diabetic patients. And so the key question that I think I would like you to tackle is whether we do have evidence if we have a stand which would perform better than the others. I'm happy that you asked me that, Marco, because uh, diabetic patients represent more than 400 million patients and there are very few stu studies dedicated to diabetics. And most of the data that we have are from sub-studies, group analysis. I agree, um, that's a key point. <coughs> so we need to start planning and executing dedicated Correct. studies to diabetic patients. 
And what we have seen is that, of course, second generation DS uh, perform better than first generation, uh, indeed, than Taxus. But after that, we have very few data. And what we have seen is that mot most of them uh, behave the same with diabetic patients, uh, more or less all the same and worse in diabetic patients. They have tried to reduce strat thickness to 60 to 80, 74, whatever. And then they have tried to put uh, biodegradable polymers, no polymer, change the drug, to drugs, and the results are always the same, are mostly twice the events that in non-diabetic patients. The only platform that I, that I see which ha can have something different, something innov innovative, is the Create Stent, which have laser duct wells, so they can release the drug formulated with a carrier, with an amphiphilic carrier, which is more or less a fatty acid. So with this technology, uh, they said that they can increase the drug concentration within the vascular cell, which is important because we know they have uh, resistance to the drug. We need more concentrations. And the distribution of the drug is more homogeneous. So we can avoid high concentration of drugs close to the stem, then a gap without drug, then high concentration of drugs. And I think that's important. And this device, the Create Stem, we have this, this technology uh, has been seen in, in registries and small randomized trials that the performance in diabetic is really good. But this was only a theory, so now we are running in Spain a randomized trial with uh, 1,200 patients, which is comparing one-to-one -one resolute cetrolimus luting stent versus CREATE. And it's performed all in, only in diabetic patients, with all commerce diabetic patients, primary PCI, rotablate or multivessel, all the patients, with the only inclusion criteria to be diabetic. And now we have enrolled nearly 700 patients. And we hope to, to have data within the next year. So let me first commend you and your group because actually the execution of such a difficult study is really something to be really commended. That's a highly needed study and I'm personally really looking forward to the result of it. I think it would be important to uh, clarify that we do have evidence uh, with respect to late loss, with respect to this stent, which is a CRE-8 stent. And what is really impressive that late loss with this stent is absolutely stable in patients with and without diabetes, which is something we never saw with other stent platform. So this concept that by using this lipid carrier, you can actually increase the intracellular concentration of serolimus seems to be very solid and actually at least at a mechanistic end point of late loss examination, very, very reproducible. Now, Rosalie, we discussed now the focus with Rafael was really indeed the uh, efficacy, but let me go back to you because you see so many diabetic patients who are yeah. elderly, who have comorbidities, who are for sure a lot HBR, meaning high bleeding risk. So the question to you, how can we put things together with respect to efficacy and safety? Um, I think firstly, the efficacy is very important because if you look at efficacy, you want uh, you know, uh, uh, results which are long lasting. And the reason is this, because if you have a result which is not as good and the patients come back again, Therefore, the risk of periprocedural complications is higher, and you have to add on dual antiplatelet therapy for a much longer period of time. And correctly, as you said, especially for patients who are elderly, they have high bleeding risk, has stated uh, risk factors for bleeding, uh, this will not be in a good uh, situation for the patient. Uh, and therefore, when the other aspect that we want to look for is a reduction in dual, a, a dual antiplatelet therapy duration. Uh, once again, if you have a repeated procedure, a longer period of DPT, and this is what you want to avoid. And secondly, you would like uh, uh, a stent that uh, can heal much faster. And therefore, you will have a reduction in the use of uh, the APT, and for shorter duration, ideally for at least a month. And we do have uh, some of the stents that have uh, been shown uh, and accepted as uh, for you to use a shorter du the APT duration. But one of the other stands, of course, when uh, talking about CREATE, is that the healing is much faster. It has this bioinducer surface, which is uh, covered by carbon, which is less thrombogenic. And uh, this makes one uh, feel a bit more confident, uh, confident uh, to actually use a short dual antiplatelet therapy duration. Right, and perhaps it's also important emphasizing that this technology has been engineered such not to have any polymer. Yes. And so the yes. fact that it's completely polymer free yeah. is yeah. at least potentially, theoretically, a great advantage of yes. reducing inflammation, inflammatory burden, which of course may actually require a prolonged DPT duration. Well, I think it has been a terrific discussion. I learned a lot from you guys. So let me thank you first for your insights and for answering my uh, perhaps uh, basic questions. So basically we have been discussing diabetes. I think there 
is a, a consensus among us that despite the guidelines taking a very clear-cut position against PCI as a preferable option, we do have a huge room for PCI in this patient. We know that these patients are very complicated with a lot of disease, so we need really to think twice what to treat and if to treat. Now, the good thing that we have learned that we can actually combine efficacy and safety together in one single platform, and perhaps one is begetting the other and vice versa, yes. so that if you are more efficacious, you can be actually safer for the paradigm that you were describing to us, that if the patient does not develop restenosis, you need to restand that lesion, which would again require a prolonged DPT. Yeah. So thank you very much, and thank you very much for watching.